Welcome to Tiki Central Canada. Ever wonder what's in that cool, refreshing drink that you just have to have on that hot summer's day? Mmm, me too. Picture a man going on a journey beyond sight and sound. He has left society, he has entered Tiki Central with palm trees, beach sand, blue skies, and God, get me a drink now! Here are your hosts, Craig and Cam, and their wacky views in drinks, life, and maybe information? Hey folks, how we doing today? Hey everybody. How we doing? All right. Gotta say, the unfortunate for us is our first snowfall of the year. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Cam looks excited. <laughs> yeah, well, it's, you know, as, as... No more flip-flops for you, my friend. Like sounds through the hourglass, we're all just a year this closer to death. This is the days of our lives. <laughs> this has turned into a soap opera show or something. <laughs> <It's> yeah, <laughs> I, I, I don't know. I just, I, I get whiny at this time of year because, uh, for one, the weather in Ottawa these days is distinctively Vancouverish. Um, and I'm getting sick and tired of people bitching and moaning about the weather. <laughs> it's true. Yeah, I know. We, have, yeah. we do bitch like, about the weather. Oh, it sticks in your bones. I'm like, yeah, welcome to my life circa 1995. Yeah, yeah I live in Vancouver for a couple of years. Yeah. Yeah, we don't see the yeah. sun for six months. Yeah. And I mean, while you do it, uh, try to buy a place there. Good luck with that. Yeah, exactly. Cause it's like, what, only a million dollars per oh, square foot. Oh, you better foot. be a millionaire, my friend. A million dollars per square foot. Knows yeah. how it works. Something like that. <laughs> All right, let's tell everybody who we are, because we all see this is not a soap opera show, and uh, this is not Vancouver Live. What? This is not Vancouver Live. No, no it no, certainly no. isn't. Uh, this is actually Tiki Central. I am Craig. I'm your bartender, mixologist, and information for the hour. And uh, my name's Cam. I'm uh, the village idiot. <laughs> wait, wait. Villages don't... Well, I guess they still do exist, but we live in a city. So are you the city idiot or the village idiot? Well, you see, in the 90s, I think, Ottawa and the surrounding townships were agglomerated into a single entity. Uh, but uh, I'm still loyal to the original Ottawa, which, in my view... Was Ottawa Valley? The Ottawa Valley? Yeah, man. Is that what they used to call it? Ottawa Valley, I guess? I, just... I thought valleys required mountains. I don't know. I don't think so. We're going to get a lot of hate mail for this. Yeah, I know. We are. <laughs> okay, let's go on to the show. Oh, my God. It's going to get too crazy now. So what are we talking about today, my friend? So today, we're going to do a Dawn Beachcomber classic drink called Three Dots and a Dash. Deep, Interesting deep, name. Beep. That's Morse code. Do. Morse code. Hey, very good. Yes. Hmm. Yeah, 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 it's cool. Yeah, for sure. So Three Dots and a Dash. Where did this name, uh, like, like where where to come from? Or maybe it's easier to ask where the drink come from. How about we start with that, the origin of the drink? Sure. Okay, so there we go. So like I said, it is a Don Beachcomber uh, original cocktail. And a guy named Hank Riddle, riddle me that. So no no relation to Tom Riddle, a.k.a. Lord Voldemort. No. Oh, okay. Okay, that's too sci-fi for me. I don't know what that is. <laughs> it's Anyways, fantasy. So Hank I'm Riddle sorry. actually used to work for Donna Beachcomber. He worked for him for 40 years hmm. in different locations of Donna Beachcombers. Mm -hmm. And so he actually had a notebook and he actually would write down the recipes. Okay. So before you go further, yes. I, I do feel that a little, like a quick recap of who Don the Beachcomber is. Sure. Uh, would be good just for our listeners. Sure. No I mean, I, I obviously know who he is. So. <laughs> That's right. You're on the show. You're not That's just, right. uh, you're not just reminding me. You're just a me. book of knowledge. <laughs> Here you go. <laughs> Uh, Don uh -huh. Beachcomber actually is the first, well, he basically is a creator of tiki cocktail in the United States and North America. Hmm. Uh, he started his Don Beachcomber uh, location in the 1940s. I see. And so he's the one who's like the pioneer of tiki culture, basically. The progenitor, if you will. The man who started it all and uh, right. basically let it grow into what it is today. So then he's got this little, like, Lord Voldemort... Um, uh, <laughs> Hank uh, Riddle. Hank Riddle, sorry, <laughs> sorry. So it's like Lord Voldemort's, uh, you, you know, rural cousin or something. That's it. So he basically worked him as a bartender. Okay. And he wrote notes down of the, all the recipes that he worked with. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so what ended up happening is that Jeff the Beach Bum Barry, we've talked about him on several shows before, yes, yes. No, um, him, took his recipe book, his notebook, and then decoded it like we've talked about before in every sure. shows before, episodes before. He decoded it and then basically wrote it and published it into books. Mm -hmm. But getting back to the drink we're talking about. Yes. 
How did it start? So the drink actually started in uh, the midst of the World War II. Mm-hmm. And the Morse code, like you said, Morse code, that's correct, for V was actually three dots and a dash. Okay. So, do, 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 do. Yeah, that is not a test. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All of a sudden, there'd be a message going across. Yeah. So, so why were they using V as the name? Because, I mean, I remember seeing a pretty cool sci fi um, kind of Invasion of the Body <gasps> oh Snatchers God, show yes. in the 80s. V. Um, and I know that there was a remake sometime relatively recently, but but the 80s version is is the... Uh, the best. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, by the way, a little fun fact about the show you're talking about. Mm. The guy that does Freddy Cougar. Cougar. Um, Robert Engeld. England. Yeah, yeah actually, Robert Englund. He's actually in that show. Oh, you're kidding me. No, I remember correctly. He actually is one of the main characters in that show. V. He, he's one of the good guys? Uh, no, he's not one of the uh, guys. Ah, okay. <laughs> I was getting worried there for <laughs> no, a second. No, no, no. He's still keeping his bad habits no. going around, yeah. So I have to assume if this uh, drink was made in the 40s that uh, the reference with the V was not this movie for not this the TV show, show or from the, the 80s. Show. Yeah. So, so what did the V... Uh, Represent? Yeah. Yep. Yeah, so in 1941, a character called a name Victor de Lava. That's a cool name, eh? Victor de Lava. That's Hi, kind of amazing. I'm Victor Delava. My Please love, it's burning hot room. for you. It's like, <laughs> like rock that is melted. How do you say lava. Uh, obsidian? Oh, wait, yeah, <laughs> lava. So, actually, he is a Belgian native who mm. worked in London, and he actually hosted a BBC radio show. And so, on the show, he would actually would say to his countrymen who were in Belgium, mm-hmm. they were actually... It was also Nazi occupied at that time. Sure, yeah, no, I mean, uh, to encourage his listeners so to use the letter V too. for victory, yeah. uh, or symbols of resistance. Okay, that was, the V was also a symbol of resistance. It's kind of the peace sign, though, right? That's actually what the V eventually turned into. Hey, wow, you're just so educated. You're yeah. awesome. You're on top of it. Yeah, so the the V for victory ended up turning into the peace symbol we know now today. Isn't that fascinating? So really, it was nothing it were like like the peace symbol doesn't have anything to do with peace. It has to do with overwhelming your opponents to such an to effect point where you that you have, have total peace victory. And victory, uh-huh. exactly. Yeah. Now, is there something uh, in England where like? It means one thing, and it means something completely different for us. Oh, no, no, no. Okay, so I can actually speak to this. So I know, like, when you're talking about the V sign, you're talking about the palm outward. Right. Now, when you uh, do it the other using, way. Yeah, when you do it the other way, it refers, it, it's up yours. Screw you. Yeah, screw you. Um, and it refers to the Battle of Agincourt when uh, British longo- longbowmen... Uh, fought Say that off, ten times over. <laughs> I'd rather not. Thank you very much. Uh, fought off uh, the French armies. F- fought off French knights, mm-hmm. where the French had uh, crossbows, which were very, very powerful weapons and didn't require a great amount of skill. It was kind of point and click, right? Right. Um, but their rate of fire was significantly lower, and their range was less than that of the British longbowmen. And so the British longbowmen uh, decimated the French knights on horseback. And at the beginning of the battle, like the French were well aware of the longbowmen's uh, prowess and danger. And so Mm -hmm. when they captured uh, an archer, a British archer, they would cut off his index and middle finger. Ah, okay. So there's some significance to this. Yeah, absolutely. So when those archers were at the Battle of Agincourt, they waggled their fingers at their opponent, showing that they had their bow... Uh, notching uh, or or arrow notching fingers. fingers, so they could they could still fire their bows. Uh, kind of like screw you, I'm still gonna be able to shoot my arrow. Yeah, ah, yeah. very interesting. Mm. Mm, very cool. It's kind of cool. Also, another person that took on the V for victory was mm. Winston Churchill. Yeah, no, and I I mean, there's a famous photo of him doing the V symbol, I yeah. guess, huh? Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So the Morse code for V, and that's like you just said, Morse code is the three dots and a dash. Okay. So, so this drink symbolized victory. Victory, that's right. Victory over one's senses? I over guess one's so. liver? <laughs> one's oh. liver. Yeah. So, okay. Now I win. <laughs> hey, hey, well, there's, there's more. There's more. Oh, okay. okay. So the Morse code V was also important during World War II to the men on the ground because um, what it would do happen was that a plane would fly over and do the Morse code for V for victory. Mm-hmm. And people, the, the troops on the ground would know that, okay, we're safe to 
proceed forward because we've won the battle in that area. Ah, uh, okay, yeah. So, so it's, it's like the bombers say, have yes, you're decimated. free and clear. You're good to go. March forward. Wow. March forward. Yes, very good. So what's in the drink? All right. So the recipe. Now this is another one of those tiki it's mostly cocktails. jet fuel. Jet fuel. In the blood of Germans. <laughs> this is actually is one of those uh, tiki cocktail drinks that's elaborate. Mm. Has different layers to it, mm-hmm. and we'll go through it for sure. And also, we will also post it on the, the site as well. Yeah, as always. Um, so let's go through it. So we got you one and a half ounces of Martinique mm-hmm. rum, which is actually a French Caribbean rum, mm-hmm. and half ounce of Demerara rum, which is the light brown kind of sugarcane rum that's originally comes from Guyana. Okay, so so like maybe like a bit more syrupy kind of like Correct. it's a thicker. Okay, it's, yeah. um, you know what you know when you when you um, I don't know if you've done this like you make say you make you have coffee right and you have white sugar in there, mm-hmm. then you take like brown sugar mm-hmm. and make a coffee. Yeah, it's got a bit more Molasses, substance you can to taste it. it yeah. Right? yeah, 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 yeah. So that gives it a little more character, a little more uh, you know zip. Uh, one and a half ounces of fresh squeezed lime juice, and I do say fresh squeeze there. Mm-hmm. Uh, half ounce of orange juice. Uh, half ounce of honey syrup, and that's like we talked about before. It's like a ratio of one to one ratio of honey and water put together. Right. Just like simple syrup. A uh, quarter ounce of the florum, and uh, that's what we've actually mentioned in a previous episode. Mm-hmm. The recipe for that, and actually we did try that today. So, what was your your take on it? Because I know you said at one point you said you thought it was going to be like this way. But it ended yeah. up being a different direction that you I, thought it was going to be. I I was actually pleasantly surprised by what Flurnum was. Uh, mm-hmm. I kind of expected it to be a much almost like like grittier spice filled like sludge. Almost? Sludge. Yes. No. Okay. No. No. And that's and that, that's the perfect word for it. Like yeah. I expected it to be kind of like like coffee grounds. Yeah. But 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 different flavors. Mm-hmm. Uh, but but I was expecting really strong, you know, overpowering uh, taste. Yeah, like like uh, I don't know if anybody else has done this, but as a kid, um, you know, occasionally in the cupboard we would have the big canister of Kool Aid powder, and the big canister had sugar added to it. So it's like as a kid, you could stick a spoon in it and just eat mouthfuls of you know, you, you know right. basically sh- flavored sugar. But then you could also get the little packets. And which were, were just the flavor crystals. But as a kid, you maybe didn't know that. And you would, you know, hit back. And so I was expecting something like that. Like just bitter flavor, yeah. no sweetness. like Super like no, Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, but in the end, it, it turned out to almost be like a, like a really nice kind of lemon, lemony or citrusy, mm-hmm. uh, syrupy drink. Like I, I could actually see myself drinking Floral. a glass of it. Yeah. <laughs> Um, slowly uh, yeah, and yeah. ideally in kind of hot, humid weather, but yeah. I could absolutely see myself uh, sipping away. <laughs> it was very, very tasty. What did you guys have last night? Flurum. Ah, I got flarinumed again. Yeah, I got flarinumed again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a, and that's a good actually uh, analogy. That, you know, like the the the. the the packets of like the, the Kool-Aid, like you said, that's super concentrated, no sugar in there mm-hmm. compared to actually like just having regular Kool-Aid. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that's a good analogy. I like that. Mm. Um, also two, let's go back to it. Okay. Uh, so, so yes. we're at a quarter ounce of Falernum. Yes. And then a teaspoon of Pimento Dram, which is like an allspice kind of uh, liqueur. Mm-hmm. And that's, if you don't, can't get that, all I suggest is make simple syrup and then put some allspice, uh, the spice in there. I see. And this lettuce through kind of let it stew for a bit let it like let it simmer for a bit yeah, and yeah, then yeah. you can use that yeah. okay yeah and then the dash of bitters i see well that's it so what do you think of this drink we actually made this today i really liked it it was it was a uh, slightly rum forward like booze forward mm-hmm. but not in no way shape or form overpowering it was sort of a like pleasantly present mm-hmm. i guess would be the way i would describe it you know, uh, with then like like some nice sweetness to it, and obviously some some citrusy zing as well. I I was very pleased. Uh, mm-hmm. In comparison, like like you know, for example, last time we talked about the test pilot, the the test pilot, and it was for me anyway. It was too licorice. Yeah, very a lot of the uh, Pernod was the, in there. Yeah, like overpowering. Like, yeah, too yeah, much anise. Yeah. But but I have to say that that tonight's drink was uh, was pleasantly balanced. There we go. Nice. Yeah. Well, yeah. what one thing I have to ask you though is that, you know, uh, w- when we're doing these podcasts, you speak in very specific terms about, you know, it's the like 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 measurements and this type of thing. Mm-hmm. But I've also seen you make actually drinks. make the drinks, <laughs> yeah, right. and that's not always the case. So, 
basically how important is it to to really stick within the margins of to follow the, the recipe? You mean? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So um, yeah, basically it's it's almost like a chef. Um, or yeah, you'll even see bartenders do this even at bars you where you go to. You yeah, you follow the recipe to the T. But mm-hmm. then also, too, there's going to be some things that are factors that might change the taste of the, the drink. And so, Such remember, as? well, like just give me an example. So, like, can, if people are like, well, I don't understand what you mean, Craig. Mm-hmm. Remember when your grandma would make your pasta sauce at home? Sure. Right? And she did have actually have a recipe that had kind of written on a piece of paper, and she would kind of follow it to the T. Mm-hmm. But then there would be a point in the, in the cooking process where she would actually take the spoon and, like, taste it. And, like, okay, it needs more oregano. And yeah, then she it was like toss in a little more oregano or something, whatever. And then more like interactive, this, right? Yeah, and let that yeah. simmer or whatever. And and so it's the same thing with these recipes that we're giving you. Yes, you want to kind of follow it to the T, like the measurements and things like this, because mm-hmm. obviously that's ratio we're looking at, right? Yeah, yeah. Like how much rum compared to lime juice or orange juice or whatever. Yeah. Also, too, but you know, something might be overpowering. So, like we talked about with the test pilot. So the test pilot, if we actually just didn't put the perno in at all and just put in one drop at a time. I think we would have got the result that we would have liked. Right. Even though the original recipe said clearly six dashes of Pernod. Yeah. So. Well, and I mean, like every time the drink is made, it's being made with slightly different uh, ingredients, even if they're, you know, within the same category exactly. and, you know, different like heaviness of water and all that kind of thing. Yeah. Or like use an example like uh, your lime. If you bought your lime fresh that day. Sure. Or yeah. it's been sitting in your fridge for a week. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you're yeah, going to have a... a different result. Right. Right. Or the rum. You buy, you know, Jamaican rum compared to Barbados rum. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, you're going to get a different kind of taste altogether. So you'll see a lot of bartenders do this. And I'm sure we've all seen it. We're a straw test. Right. And you're like, what is he doing? So that's what they're actually doing. They're actually kind of like the chef taking a little spoon in the pasta sauce and tasting mm-hmm. it going... No, you know what? It's a little off. I'm going to fix it. So could you describe the straw test to our listeners? Yeah. So what you got to do is when you finish making this drink, you got to take a straw and you got to dip it into the drink and then take put your finger and just put it on top of the straw. So you're actually mm-hmm. cutting off the vent, you know, the airflow, mm-hmm. pull mm-hmm. the straw up towards your mouth mm-hmm. and then let the finger go. And what's going to happen is it's just going to be a small portion of the drink inside the straw. Right, right. It's like a little vacuum. It's going to like a little vacuum. Yeah. And then once you let your finger go, it's going to release and it's going to go into your mouth. And that gives mm-hmm. you just enough sample that you can like, okay, yeah, it needs a little something. Sure. Right. Okay. It's yeah. like grandma with a big, you know, with a little wooden spoon in a big pot. And she's taking that little yeah, sample. Yum, 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 yum. Yeah. yeah. I got To kind of get this, the taste of what it's supposed <laughs> to be like. So are there any like well-known variations on this uh, on this style of drink? Right. So you can try different rums because um, like some of these rums are very exotic. Mm-hmm. Even for me, I had a hard time finding some of these ingredients. Mm-hmm. The florum example, like if you don't have if you don't have florum, then you obviously gonna try to do something similar to it or current like whatever. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You, like example, like the rums. If you can't buy the rums as is, then just try to find something close to it. Right. Or just try the recipe with maybe rums that you have at home. Sure. Now, if you're just trying this drink for the very first time and you're buying, let's say, the ingredients for this drink, I do recommend, like we talked about before in previous episodes, do buy the rums in smaller quantities first. Yeah, so you don't like... So buy a Mickey. Yeah, you don't Nor burn. spend $50, $60 on a bottle and find out, well, I didn't really like didn't that really at like all. That. <laughs> and mm. then you're stuck with a bottle you can't use. Mm. Yeah. Now, do you have any recommended garnishes for this, for this type? Because, I mean, it's it's a pretty tropical drink. Yes, so the garnish actually for this drink is very unique in its way, and it's not it's the only garnish you're going to see on this drink and no other drink. It actually is three cherries and a pineapple spear. So that is the... Dot, dot, dot. Three dots. Dash. Dash. Nice. Yeah. yeah. So is it shaken, stirred, you leave it alone and let it do its own like thing? Like James Bond. Shaken yeah. or stirred. Hmm. So this drink is actually is going to use crushed ice. And so I think we used, talked about that in the last one. So what you're going to do is you can pour all these ingredients into your shaker. Right. You're going to pour into the, also your shaker some crushed ice. Right. Shake it up. Don't strain it. Pour the whole thing into a glass. Okay. Ice and all. You've mentioned crushed ice before. Yes. I have an image of my mind, in my mind, of what Christ, taking out cr- his aggressions? crushed ice <laughs> entails. <laughs> but I, I get the sense, just, just because of how you've used that term, yes. um, that it's actually something fairly specific. Right. So to make crushed ice, the tool that they actually have used in the past and still today, even to this day, is actually what's called a Lewis ice bag and a mount. Hmm. Yeah. So a Lewis ice bag is actually a canvas bag. Put the ice in there and then you close it. No, canvas is cotton. 
Canvas's cotton. See, that's why you're on the show. Hey. <laughs> Fun fact for you, Canvas is cotton. All your fabric facts. That's Cam's right. one-stop shop. Yeah. <laughs> that's it. Well, what you got there, ma'am? I got canvas. That there? That's burlap, that is. <laughs> Does it shrink in the dryer? <laughs> Well, we'll just have to find out. That's it. <laughs> so it's a canvas bag. Okay, canvas, canvas bag. Basically, you put the ice in there. You close it down. Take your mallet, not a hammer. And the reason why you want to use a mallet, not a hammer, because a hammer is just going to obliterate the ice into powder. Sure, yeah. I mean, or a mallet's a mallet, got sort of a wider head, And it's right? not as, it's, it's rubber, right? A mallet or is Or wood. Just, yeah, 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 yeah. Like it's a softer wood material. Wood or rubber yeah. material compared to steel. Yeah. Right? So it's not going to crush it down to powder. It's more kind of Looney Tunes violence versus like... Da, 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 da. Um, bonk, 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 Fight bonk. Club violence. Wow. Good scenario there. <laughs> hey, I like that. Yeah. yeah. I, I was like trying that. to think of a movie with hammers being used. Uh, <laughs> so the reason why these bags have been used through time is that mm. back in the 1800s, there was no blenders. So to make this drink... You'd hire a guy named Lewis and then Say, get him this, like, here's a bag, here go and, and smash some smash ice. Smash some ice. And uh, get to it. We have customers waiting. Let's go. Damn. <laughs> That'd be great, like, for somebody who had pent-up aggressions and frustrations. It's like, yeah, I do. What a, what a stress. I bet you people would actually pay. You know what I mean? Like, if you were, like, you know, say you're at a gym and, like, hey, we've got this new program. It's, it's oh, called Oh, yeah, the, it's called the Lewis Ice Bag. Lewis Ice Bag. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah. Well, what happens? Well, you go well, in there like and the heavy the bag, crap out but... of it. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> this Get is like aggressions, porcelain plates. Yeah, I'm pretty sure they have that in Japan, actually. That'd actually be some sort of fitness program now. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> All right, so... Um, and then you'd be making drinks at the end of it, yeah. So, so like, are there, like, competition-authorized canvas bags with mallets you can use? Or, or how, like, like so, do, you, do you have to make your own, or can you so, buy these? Yeah, so you can actually buy them, and we will put the link on the, the website for uh, Amazon.com or dot, dot .ca. Sure. Um, no, actually, what I do, because I actually don't have a Lewis ice bag, what you can do is take a tea towel, kind of put the ice in the middle of the tea towel, fold it up, into a square mm. and then take your mouth and, and smash, smash it. The hell of it. Now, Craig, it are you hinting that. at what you want for Christmas? Nudge, nudge, please. I need uh, one. Pathetic. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Like, it's so funny because my Christmas list is literally like all bar tools. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, yeah. Well, well, am I not surprised? Craig, are you a raging alcoholic? Because it seems like all you want from us is just drinks and bar tools. You're like, no, I just <laughs> hang out with raging alcoholics. That's right. Um, and so I need the mallet to keep them under control. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's kind of a zombie situation. <laughs> well, what's folks. the bag for? So then they don't see me coming. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's like in uh, Batman Begins. That's um, it. <laughs> Okay, but uh, I want to rewind a little bit because yes. there's been a name that you've brought up several times over the past few episodes that it, like keeps ringing a bell, but yes. uh, and that name is Jeff Berry. Jeff the Beach Bum Berry. Beach Coming Bum Berry. Coming to a theater near you. Is. So, <laughs> uh, yeah, no. So he's he's been a writer in tiki culture and stuff for... He has been one of the publishers in tiki culture. Yeah. Uh, I see Jeff Berry actually is the, probably the one that brought second generation Tiki back. Hmm. In other words, if it wasn't for him, we probably would not have a second generation or maybe potentially even a third generation of Tiki culture. I see. And I wouldn't be here talking about it. Right. Yeah. So, uh, because you think about it, after Donna Beachcomber and Trader Vic disappeared off the map, um, all their sec all the recipes were secretive. They are all were code, written in code, or non-existent. Mm -hmm. So he's the guy that went out and like found the recipes out, decoded them, uh, reverse engineered them, mm -hmm. and brought them out to the general public. Here you go, folks. Here's your tiki cocktails right, right. here. Right. Yeah. So he actually wrote quite a few books hmm. that we S use as Bibles now. Such as what? So let's go through some. So the biggest one that he used, and the very first one, actually, it's called Sipping Safari, and he published that back in 2007. So that's a book that if anyone is into tiki culture or tiki cocktails, that'll be in their library. Mm -hmm. Like I have it in my library. Okay. Yeah. Every other book I read, like even Dal de Graft or um, the guys from uh, Smuggler's Cove, mm -hmm. they use mm -hmm. that book religiously all the time. I see. Yeah. Okay. So it's like it's like the the Bible before the Smuggler's Cove. I understand. Like we've talked about Smuggler's Cove being the Bible. Sure. Uh, then the next one after that was uh, the Glog Log. Mm. Nice little... Glog. Play on words there. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. Like glog, glog. Uh, 2013, he brought that out. Hmm. And then also, too, and this one actually is in my library. It's called The Potions of the Caribbean. 
Oh, that's fantastic. It's almost like Pirates of the Caribbean. Yeah. Right? Yeah, yeah. Oh. It's cool, yeah. And it actually does talk about the history of rum uh, in the beginning of the book, and then it goes into tiki culture after sure. that. Sure. Okay. So then, you know, like, you're like, you know how bands have, you know, greatest hits after so many albums? They're like, hey, Eagles, greatest hits. Of Rolling course. Stones, greatest yeah, hits. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, they well, want hey. to revisit. Well, you go. Jeff Berry actually followed the same process. The greatest hits was called Remix. In 2014, it combined all the books together into oh, one. Okay, into a, an, an enormous Easy lexicon of tiki book. culture. That's right. Wow. So that actually also sounds like it would be extremely expensive. These are expensive books, yeah. and they're hard to find. Yeah. Uh, the Sipping Safari one, I finally did find it, and I did get it, and it was probably about $75, which is expensive for a book. And it's yeah. not, you know how many pages in it? 200 pages. Yeah. That's... Like, it's not even a thick book. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to say that's a lot to read. But, uh, <laughs> nope, nope, nope. Uh, it wasn't a big book at all. Are there any Are there any alternatives for people who may not be quite as uh, Rich or uh, poor as I am? Actually, um, mm-hmm. Burning their credit card on both ends. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Something like that. Yeah. So actually, there is a free app you can get if you have an iPhone or an iPad, and it's called Total Tiki. Hmm. And so, unfortunately, yes, it is on only iPhone, only iPad. iPhone, iPad. Okay. Now, but if yeah. I bet you, if you go into Google search and just Google search Jeff Berry Total Tiki, I'm pretty sure you get onto a website that actually has all the recipes. I see. And actually, there's okay. over 250 recipes on this in this app. Oh, that's fantastic. Um, so, so yeah, yeah, like like with a little bit of legwork, you can probably find a lot of this stuff for exactly. gratis or for free. Uh, yeah, you yeah. know what I mean. So, uh, yeah. You don't have to go out and spend a fortune. Unfortunately, I wish I knew that earlier when I started doing this. Unfortunately. <laughs> That's right. Yes. <laughs> Do you know your tiki? What's this new segment about? So this new segment is kind of like you, did you know? Okay. And But what it is, is did you know your creators of tiki? Ah, okay. So we're going the a little bit more targeted. Of tiki. Yeah, they're pirate. We're t- actually targeting the people who created the sure, tiki culture. Sure, the progenitors, if you will. That's right. So, yeah, uh, actually, today we're going to cover Don the Beachcomber. Hmm. Yes, we've heard his Good name old Don. all yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, this is a drink that actually he made. You know, the three dots of the dash. So, a couple of facts about Don the Beachcomber that uh, you know we have if we've not brought up before, we will definitely bring up today. Mm-hmm. Uh, that he was actually born Ernest Raymond Gant. So, Ernest makes drinks. Raymond Gant. Gant. Yes. I don't think that'd be a tiki guy. Ernest? I'd be like more like... The, I just want to tip my hat to him in terms of way to change your name, pal, because, yeah. Yeah, Ernest is not yeah. going anywhere. Yeah. No, <laughs> right. I mean, if he's lucky, he'll save camp. Uh, Or go to jail. Wasn't there one... like this, Remember those used to be the Ernest series? Yeah. Ernest goes to camp. Ernest goes to jail. Ernest scared stupid. Ernest scared stupid. Ernest Saved go. Christmas. Yes, there was Ernest Saved Christmas. I remember that one too. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, you can also tell our age bracket here now. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, I really uh, think I, I really think the series peaked with Turtle Paratroopers, but uh, yeah, it's uh, kind of like you now we're done. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, but it's time to go. And that was in the first movie. Hey yo. No way. Yeah. Oh, God. yeah, and he was he was up oh, against man. Lyle Alzado. Oh man. All right, some cool facts. Uh, so. Um, Ernest actually was, or sorry, Don, Don, like, mm. you know, I don't want to call him, get it all, throw him off there. Yeah. And I'm not Ernest, it's Don the Beachcomber. It's Don. Uh, so Don actually used to be a former bootlegger during the Prohibition, and he worked on the grandfather's yacht, um, during Prohibition. So they would transport rum Jeez. from Jamaica all the way up to the States. Which one of my grandfathers that had a yacht? Hey, we're going to do something illegal, but don't tell your dad. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> sure thing, Grandpa. Yeah. You're going to be gone for a few weeks, but yeah, hey. Yeah. We're getting you out of your mother's hair. We'll tell them we're taking you to summer camp. That's all. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah so basically, all during right, his so teenagerhood. He was kidnapped by his grandfather. Kidnapped and... <laughs> by his grandfather, bootlegging rum from Jamaica up to the States. This is all before he's even 18 years old. Wow. Okay. So this guy traveled oh. all through the Caribbean. And some of the Polynesia areas as well mm-hmm. before he even turned eighteen. So well, then here's here's a cool fact. So at eighteen years old, right? He's done this now. He's traveled the world, he's bootlegged with his grandfather. Yeah. His dad he goes, Son, you need to sit down for a second. You have a choice here now. Mm. You can either go to college and we'll mm. pay for it, mm. or we'll give you the money. That's right, if you act now, we'll give you the money and you can do whatever you want with it. His grandfather, I'm sure, was in some ways kinda of like, Take the money, take the money. <laughs> <laughs> 
I'm, I'm glad, glad my parents yeah. didn't do that. <laughs> I was about to say the same thing because my that, life could have turned out a whole lot different. I'm glad my parents didn't do that because I'd be like, give me the money. What are you talking and about? And awesomer. That's yeah. right. Seriously, just give me the cash. Uh, I'll be yeah. on my merry way now. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to be dead by 25 anyway. What yeah. the hell? So very obviously, surprisingly, obviously Don takes the money. And travels the world even more. Hey, let's go even do more exploring. Good for him. So on his journeys, he goes and picks up all kinds of artifacts and art and sculptures and stuff. Mm -hmm. And also to the rum. And these different places that he's been to. Plenty of rum. So when he comes back to Hollywood in the 30s, he's like, well, I'm going to open up my bar. And that's exactly what he did. He opened up the bar. He slapped all these artifacts and statues and stuff. Right. And it's all like, come see the, the paraphernalia. And... From around the world, right? Right. Yeah. Yeah. And that was actually his stories you tell, too. Like, he would actually tell these stories to all these people coming into his bar, like, you know, places he's been and stuff like that. Also, too, so this is how big Don the Beachcomber place was. Hmm. So in 1948, now remember, this is 1948. Mm-hmm. So the Hollywood ver uh, location of Don the Beachcomber was making $1.5 million in sales a year. In 48. 48. Now, now today's wow. time, $1.5 million is good for a place to make in today's time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Imagine but, 1948. <laughs> yeah. No, that, that uh, it was a place to be seen. For no sure. Doubt. Now, the gift shop alone actually made $25,000 a year. Wow. Just in, like, here, here's a hat. Chalk cheese. Yeah. Here, here's a t shirt. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, Must have been cheese. nice. Jeez, Must have been eh? nice. Isn't that insane? Like, that's a crazy number $1.5 million in sales in 1948. Mm -hmm. Can't even imagine that now. Like, no, well, that's the that thing. Like, that's to? still a big number now. So, so, what do you think that equates to in today's time? Well, I mean, at least 10 times that amount. That's a lot of cash. Yeah. Well, that's why he built so many locations around the world, right? He just kept them going and going. You can and buy going. a lot of tiki torches with that kind of money. Oh, home. yeah. Oh. For sure. So that is our show. Hmm. Uh, packed in some information in there. And uh, let's tell everybody about who we are. We are www.tikicentralcanada.ca. All one word. That's right. And also, too, we will be announcing on our next show, by the way, the winner from the contest of last month. Mm. Yes. So it'd be pretty cool. It did raise up uh, a lot of listeners. So we have a lot of new listeners from that. So that's Excellent. pretty cool. I like that. Absolutely. Um, we will be doing another contest in December. So we're not quite sure exactly what the prize will be. I did think about maybe doing a beginner's kind of bartender kit kind of thing. Yeah, and I think that's a good idea, or at least something kind of booze-related, you know? Or cocktail-related in some way, right? Uh, you say cocktail, I say booze. <laughs> it's the mm. same thing. That's right. Potato, well, potato. Oh, yeah, potato and potato. Yeah. yeah that's right. <laughs> On there, there's the recipe page, so all the recipes are on there. Episode page is on there. There's a little bit, of course, about us and our, you know, our bio and our lovely pictures. Mm -hmm. Cam still needs to make a picture. I, I know, know, I know, I know. He was waiting for the tripod, I guess, to come in on on Amazon. I guess it's just the lighting's all wrong, you know. <laughs> you want to make like the, the perfect picture. It seems like you know what I mean, like. <laughs> Perfect. Picture. Like it's gonna end up in a poster or as somewhere. Cam calls it a regular picture. There we go. <laughs> uh, yeah, with your cat. Apparently, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, maybe I'll just take a picture of my cat. There you go and say, "Hey, this is me now." Here yeah. You go. <laughs> yeah. I self-identify. Fully converted. As a feline. Yeah. Uh, An elderly feline. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> Also, too, on there is a spot for subscribing to our show. Uh, so for iTunes, Google Play, and Player FM. Remember, folks, that we don't do any commercials or any mm -hmm. uh, sponsorship on our show. You guys are our sponsors. Our subscribers are our sponsors, which drive the show. And there's also, too, a spot on there for comments and questions. Please do ask. And also, too, to be on the show. Mm -hmm. If you think, hey, I want to be hanging out with these guys for a while and get some free drinks while I'm at it, then why not? That's why I'm here. That's yeah. He filled up the ballot and he's never left. That's right. He's like he sleeps on my front porch. Like the show is done, Cam. Why don't you go home? Craig, it's <laughs> your own fault for having a spare lazy boy. That's right. He sleeps with a dog. I don't know what's going on here. Yeah. It's like <laughs> wiggle puppy. Oh, there you go. Right, so on this note, I think we need to go grab some more drinks or uh, maybe some more florum. <laughs> we'll just drink that straight out of the bottle. Here, 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 here. here. Yeah. All right, buddy. All right, let's go take off. Talk to you later, folks. Have a good night. Goodbye. Cheers. Well, I don't know about you, but I got informed. Guys, hey, guys, where's my drink?
All your favorite facts. Cam's one stop shop. Yeah. Well, what you got there, ma'am? That there? That's burlap, that is.